Hey, what's going on, everybody? Connection Church, it is so good to be with you this morning. I see you, Connection World, whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, San Marcos, big shout out. We're coming to you guys today with a great word from the Lord. Here's the deal. We're starting right now a brand new series called Counter Culture, and we're so excited about it. It's kind of this just trip. We're going to look at the life and the journey of Daniel and his friends through the book of Daniel, and we're going to look at what it takes to live with boldness and bravery in a land called Babylon, where there's not too many people for the God of Daniel, but Daniel in Babylon is for his God. And uh, it's just a great book filled with all sorts of application for us on how we can live in a culture that doesn't always believe in what God believes and how we can take a stand for what God believes in a culture uh, that goes against counter to the ways of God and how we can live counter to the culture and be obedient to God. So we're excited about it. It's going to be great. Um, it picks up right here in chapter one of the book of Daniel. So if you've got your Bible, if you've got your notes, go ahead and turn along there. We're going to put, put the whole scripture up on the screen. So you don't even have to worry about that. But um, we're going to start in Daniel one, verse one. And it says, in the third year of the reign of Jerichoam, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. He took it over. And the Lord delivered Jerichoam, king of Judah, into his hands, along with some of the artifacts or the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylon and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude in every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter into the king's service. Among those who were chosen were, here's our boys, this is where they're coming into the story, some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, he gave the name Belshazzar, that's like, harder than trying to say Worcestershire sauce, to Hananiah, the name Shadrach, to Mishael, the name Meshach, and to Ezariah, Abednego. But verse 8, I want you to pay attention to verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and the wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this Way. I want to talk to you today with a little bit of time uh, that I have left on the clock, if you will, around this topic, cultivating courage. I'm going to talk to you about creating and cultivating courage. What does it take courage? What do you need courage for? It takes courage to say, I'm sorry. It takes courage. Come on, if, you, if you're with me, shout me out wherever you're at. If you agree, it takes courage to tell the truth. It takes courage to be different. It takes courage to take a stand. It takes, it takes courage, how about this church, to give the first 10% off the tithe and the offering. How about this one? It takes, it, takes, it takes courage to get outside your comfort zone. It takes courage to be faithful and walking through a door that God's opening in a relationship. Or it takes courage to be faithful and not walking through a door that God's closing on a relationship in your life. You're going to go through moments in life where you're going to need courage. And here's the deal. I believe it's something that you and I can cultivate starting today. So if you're with me, I want you to just kind of turn to your neighbor, wherever you're at, or throw it in the chats. Say, I'm ready. If you're ready, let me know you're ready. Say, I'm ready. Three, two, one. I'm ready. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Jesus, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. God, we thank you that you are the one in control of everything, Father, we know that you are at large and in charge of the situation that we find ourselves in globally. 
We thank you for protecting, keeping everyone safe. We thank you for today, for blessing us with the truth of your word. Help it to be something that infiltrates the character and penetrates the soul and the identity of who we are. Thank you, Father, that you're going to use today to influence us, uh, influence, to use us as influencers, if you will, tomorrow, the rest of this week, the rest of this month and for the rest of 2020. God, we love you. We thank you. We ask all this in the precious, the holy name of your amazing son, Jesus. And everybody out there in Connection World said, amen. Hey, so I want to talk to you for just a second about um, this concept of food, right? You are what you eat. You are what you eat. My wife will tell me all the time, you need to stop eating those gummy bears, babe. I'm like, if I am what I eat, and you want me to keep eating them gummy bears because, I, ergo, I'm sweet. Um, so don't get on to me. Um, but I've been trying to eat healthier. I've been trying to eat a little better. I've tried paleo. I've tried keto. And now I'm on that Edo diet. You know what I'm talking about? The Fritos, all, the whole Edo family. Fritos, Cheetos, Doritos. Um, but seriously, I'm trying, I'm trying to eat a little more healthy. I, I, I've come to understand in my, my, my more mature years, if you will, that the more I eat right, the more I feel right. The better I eat, the better I feel. When I don't eat well, I don't feel well. I don't live well. And one of the hardest parts of my life to have discipline has always been with a diet. I don't know where you're at with your diet. I don't know if you've had trouble with it, but I, I just, I kind of tell you this quick little, you know, s- illustration so that we can all maybe come around, you know, s- the thread of this story together and say, hey, if we've struggled with the diet, we pick up in the story of Daniel and he's faced with a diet decision. He's faced with having discipline with a diet. It says right here in verse eight, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and the wine from the king, he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. It said, but Daniel resolved. I need you to understand that that word resolved is that Daniel made up a decision in his heart. He made up his mind. I am not going to eat what the food, the, the food of the king on the table that is presented to me. Uh, you got to know that Daniel is at this point, he's 15 years old. He just got stripped out of his homeland, pulled away from his family. He's now put into a training program where they're literally brainwashing him uh, to read, to write, to understand the ways, the customs, the culture, the courtesies of, uh, of this new city, of this new country. And, and he, I, I love the fact that he doesn't, counter every, they give him a new name. He doesn't counter everything that they do to him, but there is this one thing that he says, I am going to push back on, going to take a stand for. Daniel's 483 years before Jesus. 483 years before Jesus. That means Daniel is in the Old Testament. He's under the Old Covenant. He's under a Mosaic law, which is very strict in its beliefs and its calling to uh, what you can and what you cannot eat. What I'm trying to tell you is that Daniel knew his Bible. He knew what the word of God said and everything they had asked him to do up until this point did not compromise the word of God that was in his life. But now he's faced with a decision where he's got a diet presented to him. And if he starts to intake that diet, it's going to go against what God's word had said to him. The principle here is that if we're not consciously being transformed by the word, the word of God, we will be unconsciously conformed by the world. If you're not consciously transformed by God's word, you can accidentally, accidentally, unconsciously knowing, be transformed by what the world has to offer, what culture has to offer you, what what the world is presenting for you to take in. Romans 12, two says, do not be conformed by the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not conform, but be transformed. I want you to know that conforming is a is the act of the is a result of um, something outwardly working its way inwardly and affecting its change. 
Transformation, however, is the opposite. It's the result of something inwardly working its way out and transforming and projecting around itself. The word of God says, do not conform to culture, but maybe I just put you on this planet, David. Don't take the diet. Don't don't be conformed by the king's table, but transform the king's table by being courageous, by being bold, by being, uh, taking a stand for your biblical views and beliefs, Daniel. If you're going to counter culture, you're going to have to cultivate your courage. And the first thing that you need to know about courage is that courage, we say things like courage is a choice. Courage is a choice. Courage is a choice. You can choose to you feel the fear, right? I heard John Wayne said it like this, like, feel the fear and saddle up and ride anyway. Right? Yeah, it's, it, you feel the fear. It's not the absence of fear, but I'm going to choose to do what's right in the face of fear. That's courage. Well, yes, that is courage, but of biblical proportions, that's not necessarily all true. See, in the Bible, courage is never given as a choice. Courage is given as a command. Joshua 1.9, have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you. You know why God has to tell Joshua, I need to remind you that I've commanded you to have courage? It's because that God knew that Joshua was going to encounter situations and moments and seasons in life where he was going to be terrified and afraid and freaking out of his mind. And God had put a command, a commission. It's not a choice. It's an order in the Bible. I command you to be courageous. I command you to have courage. That changes my whole perspective. That, that lets me know that it, it's not just something that I, I get to choose. It's, it's more of a choice of will I be obedient to God's command on my life? Have you ever heard of the, the, the term content creator? Content creator. What is a content creator? It's someone who, who puts out content, uh, an influencer, if you will. Someone who puts out something of themselves and it creates culture around them. It influences it. It has the ability to shift and to shape the way that trajectories are going. God's not called us to be content creators. He's created you to bring courage into the world. You are a courage creator. It is not a choice. It's a command by God. And here's the deal. You were created to be brave. Daniel, my boy, you're in Babylon. Be bold in Babylon. You were born for bravery. You were created for courage. Here's the problem. You can be created for courage, but not created with it. A lot of us can wrap our minds around, I was created for it. But we struggle when we take a good look in the mirror and go, I was created lacking it without it. I want to encourage you that courage is something that you can cultivate. You can possess it. You just have to learn how to practice it. If you don't practice it, you don't possess it. It's like a skill. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. You want big guns? You want muscles? You got to work it out. Your courage is a muscle that needs to be worked and lifted and used and stretched and, and, and taken to its, its limits. Like, and I, I, I tell teenagers all the time, I was a youth pastor for seven years, and now I'm a family pastor, and I, I had this one teenager who would always get in trouble for cheating on test day. And he wouldn't be able to go to camps. He wouldn't be able to go hang out with us at parties, like the youth parties and events. And I I just told him, I was like, hey, why do you cheat? And he's like, "Uh, I don't know. I just can't stop doing it. And I said, can I tell you why you cheat? And he goes, sure. He goes, I tell him it's because you don't have courage. He got all upset. No, I have courage. I was like, no, you don't have courage. So you You cheat on your courage because you don't have the courage not to cheat. I said, let me ask you this question. If your parents cheat on their taxes, right, what's going to happen to them? Well, I don't know. Let's talk about it. They're going to get fined, probably going to owe some money, but at worst case scenario, maybe prison, okay? So at 25 years old, you're 15, at 25, 
Would you cheat on your taxes if you were put into a sketchy situation? If your back was against the wall? He said, absolutely not. I said, what makes you think that if you don't have the courage to take the test and get the grade that you deserve, to not cheat on the test, that at 15, that at 25, you'll possess the courage to not cheat on your taxes. What I'm trying to tell you is that if you want to start to possess courage in the large areas of your life, you can start today, right now, by practicing courage in the little areas of your life. It's just a diet, Daniel. Nobody will know. Who cares? It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal externally. But eternally to Daniel, to something bigger than himself, it is a big deal. And if I compromise in the little things, then I'm going to have no confidence in the larger things. You're going to have to have the courage to say yes to where God's commanded you to stand for him. But you're also going to develop, when you start saying yes, not just this level of courage, you're going to develop a little bit of confidence. I want you to pick up in verse 11 of his story. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. This is what Daniel said, verse 12. Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat, water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. He agreed, and he did this to test them for 10 days. Daniel says, look, I'm putting my courage on the line because I have this confidence, confidence that my courage is not in my character, but it's in the character of God who is greater than me. My confidence is not in my ability. Look, 10 days is not enough on any diet to bring those kind of results. There is some sort of confidence that if I obey God, God's going to honor that. God's going to bless that. His confidence is not in his ability. It's in his availability to being used by God's ability in a sticky situation. Are you feeling me? He has confidence that if he does what God says to do, that God will, if God's called him to it, God will see him through it. It reminds me of this story when I was nine years old. I grew up in Georgia. Um, I was always close to my family. We would always go over to my grandmother's house, you know, once a week. My cousins would come over. My aunts and uncles would come over. Big family powwow. And there was this bully. He was 15 years old. I was nine. My cousin Chase was seven. We would always be in the the cul-de-sac riding our skateboards, our bikes. And this 15-year-old punk, this 15-year-old bully would always just, he would always just circle us like a great white shark waiting for a moment to strike. And uh, I remember we had the confidence to tell him, you ain't going to do nothing. You ain't about it. I'm going to I bet you if you come over here, uh, 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 little kid, right? Stammer, stammering and stumbling all over my words. I, I, you, you're going to get two hits, me hitting you, you hitting the ground. And he wouldn't even come touch us. One day, I remember specifically telling him, like, come over here and I'll teach you your blood type because you can be positive. I'm going to whip your butt. And he wouldn't mess with us. Why? Because I had confidence, not in my abilities, but I had confidence in my aunt's abilities. See, like a couple months earlier, that boy actually walked up to me and popped me in the nose. It was two hits. He hit me. I hit the ground hard. And then I looked up, and in the fog of war that I was experiencing as just a little boy, I see him running down the street in sheer fear and terror for his life as my Aunt Lisa was gaining ground on him to catch him. He was on a bike, and my Aunt Lisa caught him on the bike, pulled him off the bike in mid-stride with his ear, ran him into his father's house, kicked down the door practically, and then told the father, your son is a bully. If you won't teach him a lesson, I will, and then I'll turn around and teach you a lesson. She walked back down the street with this swagger and this confidence that instilled a confidence in me and my cousin that guess what? Every time he comes around, he's going to be scared to touch me because if he messes with me, guess who he's got to mess with? See, Daniel, is, he's, he's aware of the presence of God, not just on his life, but in his life, that there's a confidence that if you mess with me, 
then you get to mess with my heavenly father. Some of you just need to be encouraged by the word right now that Hebrews 13, six says that. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? If God is on your side, church, if God is with you, San Marcos, if wherever you find yourself on the couch watching this today, if God is for you, who can be against you? If God has got your back, what are you worried about an attack coming from behind you for? Listen, if, if Dave, David writes a Psalms about, I was, you, God prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies and he's not freaked out. Why? He knows he's in, he's in, he's in the presence of his enemies in the presence of his heavenly father. You got you to gotta get outside of your confidence being in your character and putting it in God's character. Courage develops a confidence in your life. It's going to take confidence, Right? in God's protection on your life to get out of your house and get back into society in the middle of a pandemic. It's not your cur- it's not your confidence, it's your courage invoking God's a confidence that is in God who is larger, who is greater, who is your protection, who is your provision, who is who is able, who is who is with you to carry you and walk you to get you to where you need to go. It's going to take courage your courage to enact God's confidence into the situation with your marriage, with your family, with a relationship. Listen, it'll take courage for for you to stick with your wife. It's going to take a lot more courage for her to stick with you in the long run. But you can have confidence that if you put God in the middle of that marriage, that it's not you holding the marriage together. It's not God holding the marriage together. It's, it's, it's not you or her. It's confidence that God is in the middle bringing you two closer to each other. You got to have confidence. Courage is a command that leads you to, to make courageous, bold choices with confidence that it is, it is God who is on my side, that if God told me to do it, I'm going to be obedient. No matter what the cost, I'm not willing to compromise my courage or cheat or cut corners. And when you get to that point, when you've cultivated a courage that has a confidence not to compromise in the face of fear, it becomes contagious to those around you. Verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier, they looked better nourished than any of the other young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink, and he gave them vegetables instead. These four young men, to these four young men, God gave them knowledge and understanding and all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. I need you to understand that it goes beyond just the table. I believe that the moment that the guard saw that what was working for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was something that was going to work for all the boys underneath his command. And now the courage to be confident in what God had said to do is now affecting all the Hebrew boys who are in this three-year schooling. But it goes beyond that. God honored Daniel. He blessed Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He put them in positions where, hey, if you'll be bold for me on this level, then you will be bold for me on that. I'm going to position you. I'm going to give you leadership in other areas of this kingdom. And we're going to go through the rest of this book. That's why you need to tune in every week for the rest of this month, because you're going to find out how the courage that was cultivated in chapter one starts to become contagious in chapters two, three, four, and on in the book of Daniel. It, 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 it becomes uh, the, whole, the whole sphere of Babylonian becomes uh, encounters the God of Daniel because of the courage of Daniel. I'll end you with this story about contagious courage. We were at a youth camp one year and we had this big seven story uh, sky rise that you climbed up, you strapped in, you put a helmet on and it was kind of like a zip line that you would zip on and zip down. But the other side of it, you would take a leap of faith is what it was called, a leap of faith off, and you would trust that the line would catch you before you hit this, you, before you splat after falling six stories. It was crazy cool. Like you would just see kids jumping and whoo, 
cool free fall. And then all of a sudden, like a Mission Impossible movie, just right. And then from the bottom, it looks really cool. You're like, oh, that's amazing. I'm gonna do it. You get up at the top and you're like, whoa, this is like 75 feet up in the air. No way. Uh Uh-uh, not happening. We had this kid who was terrified the whole camp, didn't want to be there, didn't believe in God, didn't want anything to do with Jesus, didn't want anything to do with church. We practically got drug him to camp with one of his friends. And this is the last day. And uh, his friends kind of persuade him, coerce him. Like they don't, they don't do it gently. It was kind of like, you're going up, we're dragging you up, we're pushing you up. He gets to the top, you're going to have fun either way. That's their mentality. He gets to the top and he's on his hands and his knees and he's crawling to the edge crying. And he looks over and he's like, I'm not doing it. I went down. I can't do it. And we're all talking. You got to be courageous, man. Right? You got to, you got to, you got to, you got to have courage. You got to have courage. You, you've got to, you just got to feel the fear and do it anyways. And we were trying to just get him to like, it's okay, man. Look, it's, it'll catch you. It's rated to hold like two tons. You're like a, 13 year old kid, you're God, you're good, man, you're good. And he's like, I'm not doing it. He's like shaking in fear, trembling, and they can't take him down. The only way off is to go over because there's a line now all the way up this apparatus. And what we thought we could, co- we could push him and force him into acting on his courage, you know, what we were doing, we found out was wrong because his best friend said, Hey, how about this? How about I go first? He said, okay. He said, just watch me. So his friend gets on the, the edge of the ledge and he looks at his buddy and he says, I'm going for it. And he says, okay. And he jumps. Whoo, boom. Catches him. Slow descent to the ground. And he gets down the ground. He's like, man, that was awesome. That was amazing. This is awesome. And I looked at, looked at the, the, young, the young man and I said, hey, you want to do it? And he goes, if he can do it and it can hold him, then I think it can hold me. He strapped in and without hesitation, he jumped. What I'm trying to communicate to you is that sometimes all it needs is an act of courage in one person for it to break out in the entire culture. It takes one father to be courageous in leading his family to church for the entire family to come to church. It takes one wife to be courageous in praying patiently for her husband to come to Jesus and to know him day and night, night and day for the husband to come. It takes one person to be courageous and stand up at work for a belief system that goes against what the employer is telling the employee for the entire staff to break out with courage. Courage is contagious. And if you will step out in courage boldly, knowing that it is not a choice, it is a command by God, that your confidence is not in you, but it is in him who has called you to be courageous, that it will be contagious to everyone you meet. And that is my heart, that is my prayer, and that is my hope that the Connection Church would be a contagious church, not to just Hayes County, but not to, not even to the, to the country, but to the entire world, that people would look at connectors and go, I want what they have. I want to live like them. I want to have faith like them. Wherever you're at, Wherever you find yourself right now, here's what I need you to do. Just bow your heads. I want to pray for your courage right now in this moment. God, I thank you that every man, every woman, every boy, every girl listening right now would be inspired, not by my words, but by your word through me, Father, to, to, to build, to cultivate, to create a culture of courage within the environment that you've placed them whether that is school or a job or a relationship or family, Father, that you would, you would start to cultivate the courage, shift the mentality, Father, transform our minds that it is not a choice, it is not an option, it is a command to be courageous. And give us the courage, Father, the ability to be courageous in the little things that we face in life so that we don't cut corners and compromise later on in life in the bigger stages, the bigger areas where our courage is going to be called on to take a stand for you, God. I thank you that as we we, we are obedient with our courage, that you're going to continue to instill a confidence in us that it is not us, it is not by our strength, it is not by our might, but it is by 
your spirit. It is by your power that you, you pull us through, you see us through these situations. Thank you for giving us the confidence, God, that whatever happens, the outcome is not an external outcome for us. It's an eternal outcome for us, that life doesn't end when life ends here. It begins in a relationship with you eternally in heaven. Give us that confidence, that boldness we need to live for you every day. And then put us in positions, Father, to be contagious with your, with your word, to be contagious in culture, to be contagious with our courage, Father. It's what our, it's what our church needs. It's what our world needs. It's what, it's what our leaders need, Father. We love you. We thank you for giving us this courage. We thank you that we are courage carriers in a world that is counter courage. Love you, Jesus' name, amen. Hey, here's what I want you to do. If you need Jesus today, if you, if you are in a place where you're like, I, hey, I love, I love everything you're preaching, but I don't, I don't have a relationship with Jesus or with the God you speak, I wanna give you just the chance to hit that, that button right down there. The Bible says that if you'll believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. That God loved you so much that he came, he lived a sinless life, he died for you and took your punishment, took your, took your price for your sin, and he, he paid it all at the cross. And then he was buried in a tomb and three days later proved that he was who he said he was. The check cleared on resur resurrection day. And we have faith that God did what he said he did for us at the cross, that he forgave us and gave us the free gift of salvation at resurrection. If that's you, if you're gonna believe in that, God, I need you in my life. I, I, I need to make you the Lord of my life. And I believe that you, you came, you lived, you died for me and you saved me. If you're believing that right now, I just wanna say a quick prayer and then I want you to hit that button. Jesus, thank you for those individuals right now who are giving their life to you. Thank you that as they surrender to you, you are giving them the gift of new life, new identity, new purpose, a new mind, a transformed mind from the inside out, that they are a son and a daughter of you, that they have an eternal resting spot, but that not, not just, not that you're just going to be with them in heaven and eternity, but that you, you're giving them life and life abundantly right now in this moment, God. Thank you for them. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if that was you, I want you to make sure you let us know in the comments, hit us up in the chats. If you're at San Marcos or any of our other locations, make sure you're letting someone know, I made that decision. I made that decision. We want to resource you with some next steps and how to walk out that faith just a little more courageously. Again, my name is Bobby. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to, forward to seeing you next week as we continue our series, Counter Culture.